So welcome everybody. Hello. <laughs> so um, yeah, we are in Berlin in our uh, studio, uh, Familie Flöt studio, where we usually rehearse and work. And it's actually our first live Zoom lecture that we are doing here. So we are all pretty nervous. So we have uh, Johan and Reinhard in the background that are doing the technical stuff. And um, Fabian is here with me. Yes. So we shortly introduce ourselves. So um, you start. Uh, yeah. Um, hello, uh, I'm Fabian Baumgarten and I'm an actor at Familie Flut since five years. And I'm also very nervous. Um, because uh, you are the first audience since a while, actually. And uh, so thank you very much for coming. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I was a bit uh, nervous. So I put on my costume because normally we do some sort of uh, such a talk after a show. So uh, this is my safe place and uh, I have a costume on and uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Okay, I'm hi. I'm I'm one of the co-founders of the company. So we started working together in '95, uh, I think, and um, I'm an actor as well, and um, it's recently also director. And I'm doing the masks for for the company. So from the beginning, uh, uh, we work uh, with full masks um, in familiar flutes, and. Um, yeah, we are totally out of training to be in contact with audience. Uh, you, probably many people of you share the same problem. And um, so um, what we try to do tonight is um, to reflect a little bit for you the process, um, how we work with the masks. And you see some of them here. And uh, all those characters um, are from a play that we did uh, 2018, I think it's called Dr. Nest. And um, there are some of the, 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 the guys and the girls from the show. Uh, there are many more. I think together it's 22 masks, I think. So there are some of them. And what we try to do is um, to, um, to go a little bit through the process how we we can't say usually because every creation process is different every place different but we try to give you some examples and some pictures and some short videos um, of the creation of Dr. Nest and uh, when we talk about uh, the creation of Dr. Nest um, we can say that it all started with this house um, so uh, when we start to make a show or to create a show, there is no script, no written script yet. So we start uh, really from zero, so from scra scratch. And usually there is one initial idea of the play. And in the case of uh, Dr. Nest, it's this house, uh, which is a particular house. It's in, right in the center of Germany and it still stands there. And it was the home of one of the actors of the company, of Björn. And he grew up in this house. And um, the special thing about this house is that it's part of a community in the countryside. Um, and it's a huge project where uh, people with mental disability uh, live together in a huge, pretty huge community. I think about 200 people are living there. It's two small villages in the countryside. And they share their life together. They work there, they live there, and uh, they are doing uh, very interesting things. And uh, Björn grew up in this house. And it was an idea that grew for many, many years that Björn wanted to make a show about his experiences and in a way about his story, how he grew up with all those very particular people. And um, we have some people that were actually part of the family of Björn. Those are the people. So we can say that this group of people um, 
were kind of the initial image or the initial idea to create a play. Um, the other thing that was there from the beginning was that in 2015, um, the English uh, doctor, writer, neurologist Oliver Sacks died. And um, so uh, his stories and his work popped up uh, again, connected those two things. So this, um, the stories from Björn's childhood and from Björn's story, how he grew up, and the stories um, uh, from Oliver Sacks. And uh, those two things together, like were the initial, initial moment uh, to create the play. And yeah, we would uh, like to show you a little teaser from the show, which actually we, we are not doing the teaser in the end of the show. I think we did this teaser, we did six months before the premiere. So we didn't know while doing the teaser where the piece would go. So um, yeah. yeah, we try to show try it to you. To Something is happening. direkt danach zum Bildensemble. Right, okay. So uh, the main character who is called Dr. Nest is uh, pretty much inspired by um, Oliver Sacks and also by other writers like Alexander Luria, a Russian writer who uh, was a, a, a good friend of Oliver Sacks and uh, who did a pretty similar work in a way. So the combination was interesting for us of um, uh, uh, observing and reflecting on strange um, phenomena on strange stories with strange illnesses and um, um, and the combination of um, yeah making stories out of uh, out of those uh, cases so and then um, in the beginning um, we start uh, really with the ensemble so this is uh, the first big decision that we make when we start to make a play so as I said, we don't have a script yet, um, but we have a group of people that we decide. So first it's the actors who are always also the writers in, our, in the process of our work. And this is the first big, um, big decision. Um, so to find a group of people that in a way commit to this, uh, to this initial idea. And um, so it's more as we don't have already characters or we don't have um, script or we don't have uh, scenes so we don't know in the beginning who is playing what so it is more that a kind of band comes together and uh, we don't know yet who is playing which instrument and uh, it's also uh, that in uh, we did I think 13 or 13 plays uh, uh, with familiar flutes and never there was um, um, the identical cast. So the group of people, the ensemble, always uh, was always different from play to play. 
Yeah, and what I also really like um, while finding the ensemble is that there's also a big focus on the chemistry between the people. Um, and that's because it's not a decision for, I don't know, for like half a year you do a play. It's more like a decision for the next five years where you rehearse and then you're going to play this piece five or ten years. And it's very important that you like each other because you're so much on tour uh, that uh, if that if you don't have this chemistry, then it affects the whole the whole plan and the whole idea. That's, yeah, I really like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's usually we stay at least together for five years. So uh, maybe one year for developing the play. Um, so we work more or less always a period of uh, 16 weeks to make a play, but with big intervals in between. So um, it is not one block, the creation, but it's more in, yeah, in the period of one year, um, we work about um, more or less four months together. And then as we don't have a play, it's the big question how we start to work together. And um, there is the next image. And uh, the first thing that we do um, is, so we try to create a, a temperature. So we play a lot of games. Um, we uh, do a lot of uh, very uh, apparently silly stuff and stupid stuff. We make a lot of uh, ball games. We invent games. Uh, we sing together. Um, we um, So people uh, that know to do something teach something to the other people so that we can start to learn something together. So this can be very simple things that we invent together. So very stupid games. So we try to get a physical... Uh, a, a, a physical work together and um, pretty much without any mm, content. So they are not, not yet uh, really working on a script or working on a play, but there's a, a, a period of time in the beginning where we just um, also know each other in a physical way. And then um, there is a thing where the mask work uh, is introduced in a way. So what we do, we can see uh, uh, here, there is one. What we do is that from every actor from the cast, uh, we do um, um, a cast from plaster. So of, we mold, we make a mold of uh, the whole head and also the, the back head uh, and we fill it with, with plaster. And um, when you never, um, uh, had your head um, molded with plaster, so we do it with silicon and then with plaster. This is also a thing of uh, to trust each other and uh, to care for each other. It's an important, um, Im important part of the process. So, and then in the end, um, we, everybody, uh, yeah, there we, we see how we do it together. So we help each other. And then in the end, uh, we have uh, the, the mold uh, of everybody. So this is Benny and uh, Fabian. Yes. yes, right. For me, it really felt like an, like an acceptance ritual for, <laughs> for a cult or something. But, but uh, because everybody was always there. So the whole group came together. And uh, yeah, for me, it was also a very special moment to, to do this together. Yeah. OK. And then. Um, we uh, slowly start to work on the script. And what we do is um, uh, say that, that there is a, like, like two main um, not methods, but, but ways or possibility to create a play. And the first is maybe more story driven and the other is more character driven. And what we do in our writing process is very much uh, we work on the characters first. And um, we spend like three, four weeks uh, where all, every actor from the cast um, creates many, many characters. And um, we don't know yet what is the story between them. So we don't care very much in the beginning about relationships between them or about stories, but we focus very, very much on the authorship uh, of the actor, which is the writer as well. And uh, we help each other to create characters that in a way 
are urgent for the actor in a way. So there is no story yet where we try to fit them in, but it's uh, in, on a, in a very open space, it's really the question to every actor. So what would you like to embody? What you would like to play? And um, uh, yeah, and this is uh, very much as you see in the pictures, so we use a lot the wardrobe that we have. We put on a lot of uh, very ridiculous costumes. We use a lot of text. We use uh, musical instruments. Uh, and there in the case of Dr. Nest, of course, we worked a little bit about the people with disability, but also about uh, different characters of doctors, um, nurses. Um, so people that took care or that, that cared for the other characters. Um, yeah, all this work is happening without masks. So there are no masks yet. What we have is just the mold of the characters, of the actors, sorry. And uh, so this is a work that includes a lot of text, uh, a lot of talking. Um, so we produce a lot of material there. And um, yeah, something. Yeah, we also work with with interviews. Yeah. So we we make hot chairs where uh, everybody's asking question to you, and you have to answer as fast as possible. And like this, you very fast develop a character. And then and then when we have the characters and the motivation, then we can throw the uh, these characters into relationship, into spaces, and yeah, find find uh, situations, find improvisations where these characters meet each other on stage. And yeah, this is a lot uh, improvisation. Yeah. And the, in, in the creation of Dr. Ness, it was very much the relationship uh, between doctors or uh, nurses um, and, uh, and uh, disabled people. Um, can we go back to the image and there slowly uh, relationships or situations emerge and um, so we continue to work on those um, uh, on, on those drafts on those scenes usually in this period of time we decide uh, so very roughly for spaces so we uh, we build very cheap, very quick uh, different spaces. Usually we have like walls that can move and uh, things that can quickly uh, change. And uh, this is all also a work that is pretty much done exclusively on by the actors. So scenography and costume designers are not involved yet in the process. Uh, try to go to the next one. Yeah. Uh, this is a little bit, um, did I skip something? No, this is a little bit the next step. So then imagine that we have like, I don't know, three hours of material, so which is very rough and very, uh, nothing is worked out. Some improvisations are repeated maybe two or three times or developed a little bit, but there is a lot of material, we call it uh, like drafts uh, of, uh, scenes, but what we have is a repertory of characters that survive this first process. So, um, and with this inspiration or with this information of these characters, I start to work in clay uh, on different characters. Here you see some examples of um, uh, the, 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 the Dr. Nest masks. So this is nearly the only inspiration that I get or the most important inspirations is really by the improvisations that we are doing together in the space. Of course, then there are some other things. So, so usually I think this happens in every devised work. So um, parallels or other influences, pictures, material is joining into the process. So uh, a character reminds you to Vladimir Horowitz or to you you try to look for pictures and uh, you try to understand the anatomy of um, of the character. Um, you are? Uh, another important thing is that in the process of mask making, uh, I try to um, to um, 
Yeah, the most important thing probably is that a mask is a moving object. So uh, the mask itself, it moves, it's, it's moved by the actor and it's watched uh, by different angles. So the thing of the asymmetry of this object is absolutely fundamental. So um, uh, there is this basic paradox that a mask is a, a rigid thing. So they are made from paper mache and they don't move. But of course, in the end, a mask is only interesting when it moves. So the big question is, um, how does this thing uh, happen? And um, uh, this is why the asymmetry is important. So one part is uh, slightly different when the mask looks down, uh, the mask gets changes its, its expression when it looks up. So. Um, this is something that I try to include in a way in the in the modeling process. And um, the basic thing about mask that uh, is uh, interesting is uh, that, of course, there are two sides. So there is one side that is facing the audience uh, and it is watched. And there is another side, the inside, where the actor is somehow. So the mask is really in between this relationship of audience and, and the actor. So it is actually the main purpose of the mask is to create or to enable this relationship. And um, yeah. Okay. And then, um, yeah, I, I have one question because I always ask myself, um, how did you learn this? Or did you like, because you have so much knowledge about making but you studied acting and i was wondering where did you got the knowledge or yeah um so uh i i never had the plan to become a mask maker um uh, in in the where we studied in the Volkwang hochschule in germany it's um yeah um, school for the arts in the west part of germany which became famous by the work of Pina Bausch and by the German dance. And there is a little department of physical theater. And uh, in this department, we, we, we took our education and there we had some very good masks. And um, so we worked with those masks and I got in touch with mask work. And, uh, but they were always so beautiful or so holy or so uh, that I had, a lot of respect for them and I thought and there I got the idea ah I should make my own masks then uh, I can do with them what I want and I can work with them and use them as a tool and uh, what is particular maybe in our work is that for every play and this, we kept this thing so I, I did a couple of masks I created a couple of masks and then we worked with them uh, one week later, and then I made different masks or I changed them. And so the mask got really a tool that is very involved in the creation process. So um, for all the plays that we created, uh, the masks were made especially for those characters. So it's not something that I feel myself as a mask maker, but it's mm. really more that the mask is like the costume or like the text in a way. It's something that is created uh, by the company and the mask is one part of it. So I couldn't make a mask without working on a play. Mm. So I, I wouldn't feel able uh, to do this. And um, yeah, um, so what's the most important thing is that a mask starts to move and to dissolve in a way. And uh, so this is the aim when I try to build a mask that it's uh, it can become alive so it's a very simple thing but sometimes it's difficult to do and um we, no we try to show the next video a short video yeah we're gonna um we're gonna show you during this session uh, a video uh, some parts of a video series we made in the last lockdown it's called behind the mask and you can see all the videos of it on the youtube channel um, of Familie Flöts, but now we want to show a little part of uh, Hayo's episode about mask making. Yeah, the, the idea of this series of videos was that um, uh, to ask the actors, uh, it was made by Zoom as well, and to ask the actors to tell something about their character or about a particular mask. And so we interviewed ourselves 
And um, uh, it was interesting because uh, some secrets or some stories that we didn't know from each other popped up and uh, it was interesting to share those thoughts. It's very short, it's I think 40 seconds and it's a moment where I tell something about a particular mask, not from Dr. Nest, but from the play Infinita, which by the way, we played also in the London Mime Festival a couple of years ago. Okay. zu meinem Ablauf dazu eigentlich, dass ich in diesem Moment, wo die Szene stattfindet, ganz ruhig sitze auf der Seitenbühne und ähm, dem Björn dazu gucke. Und das mache ich Könnt ihr danach. Äh, und immer. Also ich verpasse diese Szene nie und äh, gucke da immer noch sehr gerne zu und entdecke immer noch neue Dinge in, dieser, in der Maske, aber auch in dem Spiel von Björn. Ja. Okay. Thank you. And then, of course, uh, when the masks are done or they are not totally uh, finished, uh, sometimes they are still without wigs or even without paint or without uh, the additional props like glasses. But then there is this moment where I bring the mask into the rehearsal space. And this for me is a very tricky moment because it's, uh, it can be very conflictive. So it can be very hard because in a way I propose to the writers of the characters or to the creators, the actors of the characters, I propose them a face. And this is something that I always feel bad in a way, or I'm, I'm pretty afraid that this goes wrong because it's a very intimate thing. As the actors create the characters by themselves, it can be kind of... Um, disturbing. So I'm very nervous always about this day where I bring the masks the first time to the rehearsal uh, space. How is it for you as an actor? <laughs> uh, uh, inter uh, interesting that you say this because um, for, for me, because we have this first block of working without the mask and then we kind of as actors, we have a break and Hayo goes into the workshop and uh, working with clay like, like a maniac. And then we come back to the rehearsals and it is for me it's just super exciting and like a big birthday party uh, <laughs> because you get all these presents and gifts uh, with input that gives you uh, new energy and all these possibilities uh, to go on and um, of course in particular for your characters it changes Thank sometimes so um, for example uh, one character you have in mind and you see the mask and it really you think ah, oh, wow it, it, I imagine it like that and the work and the journey with the mask goes very smoothly and then sometimes a character for example with this one here this guy um, I didn't really know the energy of uh, the character until I got the mask and then uh, Hayo made this eyes this crazy eyes <laughs> i showed you with ah, i stay here i stay here we make it with the technicians and um they are really like <clears throat> and like this i watched i looked into his eyes and straight away i had the energy and i knew that ah, this is going to be this guy and he's like 
and uh, so so um, it's really for me like a present when you come back to rehearsals, you've done nothing, and then you come back and you get all this input. And then the third uh, version is, of course, that a mask doesn't really fit, and you try a lot of things, and the journey of your idea of the character and then coming together with the mask is a little bit longer. And I would like to show a video of that, uh, of one of my journeys from this, this character here. This is Arne. He's very close to me. I really like him. <laughs> I put this costume on because uh, it's my safe, safe place. <laughs> and yeah, uh, let's see the video. It works, it works. Heute geht es um die Figur Arne. Also das Besondere in der Entwicklung war vor allem, dass es am Anfang war, hatte der unfassbar hohe Spannung und war, ja, es war die Idee auch der Schiff des Trainers und es war, es war ganz viel Energie da. Das mache ich mal. Und diese richtig gute Musik, der Premiere quasi, die wir doch eine komplett andere Maske. Und auch die war total fest und aggressiv. Und das hat auch wieder nicht, also gar nicht funktioniert. Und am Ende ist das entstanden, was komplett das Gegenteil ist. Also, sie hatte irgendwie einen sehr langen Werdegang, sehr, für mich sehr kompliziert, war die kompliziertste äh, Figur. Und jetzt ist die so einfach. Also, ganz einfach. Ich möchte einfach nur umarmt werden. So, uh, so, sometimes a mask doesn't work at all. Sometimes it is rejected by uh, uh, the actor. Sometimes we have no idea about the mask. So a mask that I did for a certain character doesn't work at all. And sometimes it stays there in the rehearsal space. And sometimes we invent also um, a character uh, just because a mask is there. And um, so uh, it, it can also work this way. And um, sometimes we have very difficulties so uh, to, to find a mask for a character, of course. And so one mask is rejected. And then, and then we have those spare masks that are there like a little bit like, like orphans. Uh, uh, orphans. And, and then we have a, one story uh, from one actor also in this uh, lockdown video series uh, behind the mask where Sebastian is telling a story about um, how he got the mask from the butcher in the play um, Hotel Paradiso, which is also a nice story. So we try to watch this little interview. I hope you can find the English subtitles because they speak in German. Um, I hope you can read the English subtitles. So he was lost. He had no mask uh, for a long time. Everybody in the rehearsal process had already masked for his character and he, he was the only one that had not, a, he didn't find a mask or I couldn't do one for him. And then he found the mask. Okay, we try to watch the video to start the video. Great. Wie ich zu einer Maske von Lorna kam. Ich hatte ganz lange keine. Und dann hast du gesagt, nimm doch mal die. Eine sehr große, asymmetrische, verzerrte, groteske. Das war die, die wir alle bis dato so gemieden hatten. Und hab die dann Backstage in meiner Küche aufgesetzt. Und das war wirklich ein ganz irrer Moment, weil ich, ohne dass ich im Spiegel gesehen habe, sofort wusste, wie es ist. Und da ist lange Gegenteil von meiner Fotomaske, die viel zu groß und muss sie erstmal austrocknen, damit ich nicht rumrutscht. Und dann ist es rausgekommen und ich weiß noch, dass alle haben geguckt und ja, wie ist es? Ja, das ist ein interesting thing, was Sebastian is talking about. It's, uh, uh, I think we all know this, uh, this feeling that you have a mask on and you don't watch, you, you can't see yourself, so you don't actually know how you look like. And um, when you don't watch into a mirror, you still have a feeling of how, who this is. So uh, there is a strange power that masks uh, sometimes have that they tell you something also to the inside. So not only, of course, from the outside, you see everything and you see a lot and you see the whole expression, but strangely also from the inside, it is like you get some informations and uh, Sebastian is talking about this feeling, which is interesting. 
And I think we have some more picks from the rehearsal process. So when the masks come into the rehearsal space, um, there we can say that um, the, the way how we work then on the play totally changes. So we try to reduce our own creativity and we don't produce any more material, but we try very much to listen to the masks or to learn uh, who they are, uh, which kind of stories they bring up. And um, so it's very much a work that is impressive than expressive. So it is very much to to listen to the masks and to learn from the masks. And uh, one forward, I think. Yeah, and even one, you can go on. So um, yeah, there we see some drafts from the play. We go to the next one. And um, then of course we have this rough material and then this very painful process or um, then really the work starts. So we try to adapt the material that we have, the scenes, the drafts that we have, and we try to adapt it to the masks. And this, in this picture here, or in these two photos, it looks like that it's always the same and that it's easy to, you just put on the mask and you play the same thing that you did before, but it doesn't work like this. So in a way, this photo is fake. So what usually is the process is that you realize that with the masks, you have to translate the material and to translate the scene totally into a different level. Of course, there is one thing is the talking. So usually we talk a lot in the improvisations. Of course, we know that there will be a mask later on, but still uh, when you don't wear a mask, it does not make any sense not to talk, so we talk. And so once the mask is there, uh, everything has to be expressed in the body. And of course, this changes the architecture and the dynamic and the whole, the whole scene. So, and this is um, really a little bit the moment where the fun in the creation process goes down and uh, actually the work starts. So this is a thing that also everybody prepares himself for this step uh, when the masks come into the rehearsal. Yeah. And um, then another thing with the mask uh, that changes totally is that you are blind. So uh, you don't see much. So uh, imagine that you look through your uh, fingers like this. So what you lose is all the peripheric view. So um, what becomes necessary then is to create spaces where you can feel safe. So um, in this moment, we have to start to make decisions and to make decisions about the architecture of the set, um, uh, the, the order of entrance and uh, the order and the, the, the whole architecture of the scene. So in a way has now slowly to be fixed. Otherwise you won't, will never be able to perform it with the mask. You can all only perform it with the mask when you feel exactly safe and you know everything by heart and you can move uh, in the space nearly blindly. So um, I think Chaplin said this once, uh, he, he said that the main work of the, 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 the comic actor is to, to, to have control about the space. And with the mask, this is pretty much the same thing. So you can't do anything when you are busy with uh, where am I? Or so you need all the energy and all the concentration that you have. You need for the to to bring the mask alive, and you cannot um, uh, allow yourself to be busy with other things. So this work starts in this moment that you really have to fix things. next picture so this is the moment where the set designer comes in and he starts to together with us together with the actors to uh, to decide those spaces first he draws them and then we slowly build them and we put the set in the the same thing uh, with the costume designer once the masks are in the rehearsal costume designer starts to work also first by drawing things it's nice that she uh, or he uh, um, use already the mask to create the costume. So it is not something, it is not a 
con concept, uh, so the costume. So it is also something that um, uh, emerges together with the mask. So it's a very, um, yeah, it's also guided in a way by the masks. And this is also the moment where the actor uh, gives away a little bit the responsibility. Until that moment where the costume designer jumps in, uh, in a way, the, the actor is still, as the writer and as the author of the character, is still was still responsible for the costume, for all the props. So this is really all in the, in the um, responsibility of the actor. And now the, this work divides a little bit uh, to the different departments. Uh, I think we have some more pictures here from costume and uh, and many things, many elements also um, uh, join into the, so for example, uh, we see here the guy uh, Bjorn um, who has a, a big belly, very fat guy. So those are decisions that the actor makes in the first period of the process. And then the costume designer also takes this idea. So it's a lot of authorship or um, original ideas from the actor or the author also comes into the, in the, to the creation of the costume. So uh, it can be, for example, this uh, pullover of Anna, I think you choose right in the first rehearsals, he, he chose one similar pullover, not the same. And uh, he kept this. And this is also uh, like um, an inspiration or a, a provocation for the costume designer then to deal with those things. When the writer says that this is important for the character that he wears this kind of pullover, then the costume designer has to deal with it in a way. And it's very difficult for no, I have a different concept. So this is usually not how we work. So it is very much uh, uh, shared responsibility. But of course, in the end, there is one person that makes the decision about the costume. But it is um, uh, it is sh very much the culture of sharing and uh, giving uh, information to each other. Yeah, and for me, this is re really something extraordinary uh, while working with flutes. Because I, I have a different background. I come from a classical speaking theater background, and I work a lot uh, at state theaters. And this decision process on a state theater in Germany is before I even, as an actor, come to the first rehearsal. It's already the set is decided, the costume is decided. Sometimes the director already knows what he wants the character to be like, and uh, you fulfill this thing more and with flirts it's completely your responsibility and you can be much more creative and have much more space to put your um, energy into it and that's really something very special so you, so the characters are much more close to you as well yeah i think it's also because we know that we will spend like three four five sometimes nearly 10 years of our lives with those characters so it is um, important in a way, I think, that they are that we really like them because we spend a lot of time with them. And, and uh, yeah, OK, try to see the next picture. So um, costume, yeah, we get uh, to the next. Yeah, maybe um, this is, yeah, you, you can tell yeah. something about it. So this is. Um, what is important to, to know is that in all flirts plays, there is no there is just the actors on stage. So we don't work with stage managers. We don't work with helping hands on stage. So all the things that are in motion and that I use during the show is uh, exclusively managed uh, by the actors. And in the case of Dr. Nest, the whole set is moving um, all the time. And there are, I think, 22 or 24 characters. And the actors change 15, 18, 20 times uh, during the show. And so it is a lot on organization. So um, we spend, we have to spend a lot of time to organize the space and to think uh, what is where and how do I make this. So it's a lot of organization that is invisible for the actors, for the, for the audience. But of course, it's very important to, yeah, it's a, a, a very important part of the work. And there the focus for the actor really goes off the creative part because um, you don't have any more energy for it 
the whole energy goes into the organization behind the stage yeah. and uh, every decision on stage means thousands of you know, things behind the stage and uh, it's a very your your head is steaming the whole time <laughs> in this uh, and there is, we have this rule and and i think it's 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 working in a way that everything that the actor is touching um on during the show it's in the responsibility of the actor to prepare it and also to uh, when we do the strike, um, the, the setup, uh, it's also in the responsibility of, of the actor. So to take care for costume, for the props, for the masks and uh, also for the set when it's moving. And um, yeah, and then it's kind of the last third of the production process. And uh, this is a little bit where everything comes together. And this is actually the moment when the play is actually written. So uh, until now, everything is quite open. So the order of the scenes, uh, the whole structure of the story is still very much uh, uh, open. And then of course, uh, is this period of the production when decision decisions have to mm, be done. So when the director is starting to make their decisions from the outside, where the sound designer is constructing or designing the sound, where the light is made, the video is made. So this is where the set is, um, is finished. So this is a little bit the, the last third um, of, the, of those, um, yeah, 16 weeks maybe. And then, um, there is, of course, this very big thing that is still missing, which is the audience. Um, a mask really makes no sense when it's not watched by somebody. So it's we could say that it's 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 an absurd thing to wear a mask in a rehearsal space because it cannot work because there is not the distance, there is not this community, this crowd of people that are actually taking the things from the mask. So it is a kind of, uh, like every rehearsal, it's a rehearsal, but it's a kind of artificial uh, situation. And so we invite, uh, uh, um, we do a lot of open rehearsals. So we invite like 20 people um, and to come to the studio. And then we do also some open rehearsals in theater. So this is uh, uh, the next step in a way where we try if the storyline works. Um, and this, I think, especially for the actors is opening a totally new kind of work. No? When the, the mask is actually watched and understood or not understood from the outside. Yeah, yeah, of course. The, the, I mean, the, to understand the mask, the mask really needs the feedback from the audience to come alive. So when we find a rhythm, this is skipping here, but I'm kind of tight now. We have a little. <laughs> um, where was I? Uh, so so when when we we find a rhythm with the audience in the piece, then the for, because it's so physical and the mask really demands the imagination of the audience to come alive, the audience also starts to breathe with us. And with mask work, I never have this, uh, like with, with other work, I never have this crazy energy exchange and resonance with the audience. And when it really comes together, I don't know, my, my energy on stage really feels unlimited because I get so much energy back from the audience. And this is something I, I really, really, I think the love about the, the, mask, the breathing uh, mask. is really a fundamental thing with the yeah. mask. So uh, maybe also because there is no text or no language involved or no spoken text. Um, so it's actually that the actor finds the rhythm of breathing only with the audience. So because the audience in a way has to uh, inspire, so to inhale something and then they have to understand or to relax or to exhale. And uh, the discovery of this kind of communication and this rhythm is uh, can only be done by audience. And this change on a physical level very much the the work of the actor. And um, uh, so this is a thing also where we go on working uh, um, 
um, also after the, the opening of the show, uh, we, we keep on working on the show. So we keep on rehearsing. And in the case of Dr. Nest, I think we did like um, three, four versions. Uh, so we worked until I think the 50th performance or 60th performance. And um, then in a certain moment, um, when we have the feeling that the play is there already in a way, so we maybe stop rehearsing. But it's a process that really does not finish with the opening night. When was this for you? Like I, I think with Dr. Nest, it was, yeah, maybe a, after 50 or 60 performances. I remember this, we had one show in Portugal where I had the feeling that uh, I saw for the first time the show. I think it has to do a lot with the, so when the act, what, what is happening after the opening night is that the actors or the characters maybe, I don't know, take in a way a lot of the the impact or the, take a lot of the the weight the load of the play and um, so when the story i think for the actors is not important at all anymore so mm. when they just mm. are there and they are just there alive i think this is the moment where you actually when the story actually becomes visible and until the actors are concerned about do the people understand me are they with me uh, and, da, 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 and am i telling the right thing i think until they are busy with this uh, doubts or with this part of the work i think the story cannot really um, um, be be there or be visible in a way so it's um yeah so it takes time. So I think we we always worked on pieces uh, on the plays uh, for, for, yeah, at least 50, 60, 80 shows sometimes. Um, yeah, it's an important thing for us. So the audience is changing a lot. Um, and um, it's only through the audience that we actually understand the story or that the story becomes like present or physical um there yeah okay and then we have the last picture and um fortunately we uh, could perform uh, dr nest in uh, the richthof in this first house that we uh, that we showed you and um it was a very special uh, occasion and björn came back who is there interviewed by Mats, who is a uh, dr nest who is performing the character of dr nest and he is interviewing him uh in front of this house and uh, it was a big adventure there to perform uh, uh for the people that were actually uh, the inspiration to do this play and it was also one of the last shows that we did um, before the lockdown in uh, i think it was end of february last mm. year so it's um uh, yeah, so um, after this uh, show in Richthof, I think uh, we did a couple of more, but um, yeah, it was uh, then the long, weird, uh, frightening period started, which we are still in now. And um, yeah. Since then we are stuck here in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, But we have some... We got some money at least from the state to go on so we we see some optimism coming up yeah we have to work now on our zoom uh, zoom um, abilities so to produce things online and uh, we have to get used to this for the next months and um, yeah we are working on new stuff so that hopefully we can show in the end of april and uh, we just launched uh, the applications for, for our summer academy, which hopefully will take place in Italy in the month of July. So, um, yeah, this was pretty much what we wanted to share with you. 